All right, so this is our first class in the book of Proverbs. Uh, so this will be an introduction, and there will probably be two more, maybe three more introductory type uh, lessons before we get into looking at um, specific verses. And the book of Proverbs is really interesting because uh, you have the first nine chapters, which aren't what you would expect. You know, when you think of the book of Proverbs, you think of one or two verses at a time, like little pithy sayings that get you thinking about something. But it's started out in the first nine chapters. It's like this long introduction. This It's almost like a psalm. It's like a really long poem of Hebrew poetry that is saying, please choose wisdom. Please. Like wisdom is crying out in the streets. Choose me. Don't be a fool. And then it gives different ways that you can be a fool. Um, so I'll challenge you. The next few weeks, we're going to be in chapters uh, one through nine, but also broadly looking at different aspects of the book of Proverbs, how we should look at it, how we should interpret it, uh, different background information that'll help as we go through the book of Proverbs. So read chapters one through nine. And read it multiple times. Um, we're we're going to be there in that area for the next few weeks. So read chapters 1 through 9 over and over and over. And see who the characters are. There are different people speaking. There's a father speaking to his son. Trying to give wisdom to his son. His son is young and doesn't have life experience. So his father is telling him, listen to me. I've been through a lot. I know what I'm talking about. Pursue wisdom, get understanding, get insight, get these things. It's super important. It's way better than getting riches. Interesting when you look at who wrote the book of Proverbs. Then you have uh, female characters. Wisdom, which is this concept, is personified. So it's a figure of speech, literary device. Wisdom is personified as a woman at the gate of a city, crying out to people going into the city. And telling them, please follow me. And then there's a, another woman, Lady Folly, who is also crying out, saying, no, 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 follow me. It's better to follow me. So there's this idea of the, there's two paths that you can take. The why and the road. You have to choose one. And every decision you make is basically that. It's like there's a why in the road, and you have to choose either the wise way or the foolish way. But then what counts as wise, what counts as foolish? That's what you get to learn in the book of Proverbs, and it's great. But as you're reading through chapters 1 through 9, those, there's just these chunks of uh, basically monologues from these characters. And there's the father to the son, like the wise father to a naive son. There's Lady Wisdom and Lady Folly, choosing two different ways. And then the antithesis to the wise father is this kind of scoundrel character. Like, oh no, follow me. We're going to do all these great things. We'll lie and wait for blood. It'll be awesome. We'll share a purse. It's great. Like, who's this guy? It's like, you can have instant gratification. Everything's going to be great. Should you follow that guy? Or should you follow your father's wisdom? What should you do? It's a choice. And we'll get into it later, but wisdom, it's going to, it's going to bring us back to Genesis 3, the Garden of Eden. And we'll talk about a little bit about that today, but we'll talk about it more in, in a few weeks. But the book of Proverbs. Why do we need to study the book of Proverbs? Because we need wisdom now more than ever. Oh man, do we need wisdom. There's so many things that come at us every single day uh, through a bunch of different screens <laughs> or different people. Or different people doing this into their screen, and then you get it transported to your screen, and then you watch it, and then they're like screaming in your ear all day. Like, there's so many different voices. We're inundated with entertainment and distractions and have no time for contemplation. Like, Proverbs requires you to slow down and think. Like, when you read it, and then you, you chew it over, and then you think about it, and you go, Does that really apply? I don't know if that actually applies. Is the right situation for that? I don't know. You have to think about it, right? This generation has more 
has access to more information at their fingertips than any other ger generation before. But having information doesn't make you wise. It doesn't tell you how to live. It doesn't tell you what you should do. Information and facts are not the same as the interpretation of that information. You can have all the facts in the world. It won't, it won't tell you. You can have all the scientific data in the world. It won't tell you how you should act or what you should do with that. You have to have a value system in place to decide what you're going to do with that information. It comes prior. ChatGPT can write an excellent essay on comparing male and female overtime trends in the workplace. But it can't tell you whether you should clock it, clock a little overtime to help your boss out and miss saying goodnight to your children. What should you do? Should you stay up late and watch another episode of Fill in the Blank with your wife? Did you do that? It's like, yeah. <laughs> That's my wife. <laughs> yes, you should. Right? What's the right age to introduce Lord of the Rings to your children? That's right. Train up a child. That's what I'm saying. But what's the right age? Are we talking books or are we talking the movies? Now, I mean, I'm thinking, I was thinking movies when I wrote that question. Books are fantastic. They're pretty high level. I know they're pretty big and it's it's pretty dense. Like it's it's kind of tough. But right, but I don't know. What's the right age? What if I feel differently than you? And what if your kids have already watched it and my kids haven't and then they're making my kids feel envious because they've watched a movie that they haven't seen? I did. <laughs> Sleepover. <laughs> Right, and then, yeah, so then how are we going to deal with this different parenting models, uh, apparently, that we're going to have conflict over? How are we going to deal with that? Proverbs. Proverbs, right? Uh, how do I tell my wife that I don't like what she made for dinner? You, you don't. Yeah. Right. So, but it's not that I need to say it. It's how do I go about saying it? Right? That's different. That takes wisdom. This is just like everyday mundane things. Book of Proverbs has so much wisdom for these kinds of questions. Right? The Book of Proverbs falls within the category of wisdom literature. You got Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Songs, and Job. These are the wisdom literature of the Old Testament wisdom books. And we'll take probably a whole lesson on just comparing Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Job. I think they all, they all have to work together. You can't, you can't understand all three of them without all three of them. They, they speak to different nuances of how to live your life and what life is all about and what you can expect from God in your life. But these wisdom books are very different from every other book in the Bible. Because every the books of the Bible that we're usually reading, especially in the Old Testament, are narratives. Right? You read Genesis, Exodus. Leviticus is kind of a narrative still, but a lot of a lot of legal code and things to do, how to behave in sacred space. Right? Numbers, Deuteronomy, you're getting the history of salvation through the people of Israel. Right? It's a historical narrative. Then you get to Proverbs. Like, there's no narrative. There's no story. In fact, it doesn't even reference Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. None of that. Is that stuff not important anymore? Like, what, what's, what, what is this literature doing in here? It's just, it's different. Especially when you read Ecclesiastes. <laughs> you read Ecclesiastes, it's like, is this supposed to be in the Bible? What? It is. It is definitely supposed to be in the Bible. If you haven't read it, you should. It's, it's really good. I like to think of it as the existential philosophy book of the Bible. It's like, look, what's the point? We're all going to die. Who cares? That's like a big, one of the big points in that book. And then it, that's a good thing at the end. But uh, from, from Ortland in his commentary, I pulled this quote out. As the priests taught the law, the prophets declared his word, and the sages 
uh, the sages or wise men gave his counsel. He has that three-point breakdown from Jeremiah 18.18. 18. Both the commands of the law and the thunderings of the prophets spread out before us the gigantic truths of God, the, mer- the meta-narrative that makes sense of everything. But we need more. We live day by day in a world where there are details of character small enough to, es- to escape the mesh of the law and the broadsides of the prophets, and yet decisive in personal dealings. What he's saying there is, there are things in your everyday life, should I stay up late and watch another episode of whatever with my wife? The law, I think Ten Commandments, doesn't have an answer for that. If I go to consult the Ten Commandments, am I going to find an answer for whether or not I should stay up late? Thou shalt not stay up late and watch an episode of whatever with your wife. Cool. All right, I won't. It's not there. So we need wise counsel on how to live our lives. Back to Portland. So God gave us more than the law and the prophets. He also gave us wise counsel. But we do need to be cognizant of the meta narrative. When I say meta narrative, what do I mean? What does meta narrative mean? The overarching story. Yes. Excellent. It's like the salvation story, right? What God is doing. You have to know that because this book is swimming in that story. You take the book of Proverbs out of that meta narrative, and this is what a lot of like, self-help books do, and they're like, oh, I'm going to quote the Bible in my self-help book. They rip it out of the meta-narrative where God has, in the meta-narrative, God has created the world. world is a certain way because God created it that way, and human beings are a certain way because of the fall. Those are the just real baseline assumptions that you have to start with before you can understand Proverbs. It's going to help you in your interpretation of Proverbs. But if you rip it out of that meta narrative and say, oh, this is, this is, you know, scripture and it can just apply however I want it to apply outside of that meta narrative, you're misinterpreting it. You're mishandling the word of God. You have to be within that set of assumptions for it to make sense. And because that's what it was written within is this is human wisdom that has been given to us by God. So think of it, this, this, this is human wisdom. So like what works out in human experience over the long term? What's been observed to work over and over and over again? Generally, this is true for human experience. What happens is that gets penned, right? So it's a collection of wise sayings of the, of the wise that, is true over the long term. And then the Holy Spirit puts the stamp of approval on it, and it's in Scripture. So even though there's no Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, no Israel, no, no narrative in the book, we have, to, we have to have it in our mind before we can get started. And the process went from Solomon asks for wisdom from God. God gives him wisdom. He writes down all these Proverbs. They're collected by, and then more Proverbs are collected by Hezekiah and his men. If you read in chapter 25, it's like, oh, these are more of Solomon's Proverbs collected by Hezekiah and his men. And then that all gets collected together and it gets put into the Old Testament. And the Holy Spirit is the one that put it all together. And then that becomes the wisdom that God gives to his next generations of his people. That's how we get the book of Proverbs. So it's human wisdom, but it's also God's word to us. And the process is interesting there. And so these, these wisdom books all fit within the meta narrative, but and then we have to have that in mind, but then we can move forward. So we're gonna we're gonna start, <clears throat> if you haven't turned there yet. Book of Proverbs, it's in like the middle of your Bible. It's right after Psalms and just before Ecclesiastes and Isaiah. We're going to read the first seven verses and we're going to try to get through it. 
We'll see how it goes. All right. The first seven verses, I'll read them aloud if you want to follow along. <clears throat> the Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel. To know wisdom and instruction. To perceive the words of understanding. To receive the instruction of wisdom, justice, and judgment, and equity. To give subtlety to the simple. To the young man, knowledge and discretion. A wise man will hear and will increase in learning, and a man of understanding shall attain unto wise counsels. To understand a proverb and the interpretation, the words of the wise and their dark sayings, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for this book of Proverbs. Thank you for giving us your wisdom. I pray that we would obey what it says and seek for it and obey it. And Lord, seek your face and seek your wisdom. Lord, thank you for this and help us to understand in Jesus' name. So first, the Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king in Israel. First, a proverb. What is a proverb? Well, it comes from this word that means likeness or like an object lesson. So a good way to think about it is it's an object lesson that helps you decide on a course of action. That's what a proverb is. But it's really short, really tiny. So it's not going to have all the nuances. It's just going to be a general truth that usually this works. So to quote Ortland again, so a proverb is a little model of reality, a little verbal representation of some aspect of our daily lives. And by picking a proverb up and turning it over and over, looking at it from all angles, we can see something about our lives before we step out into actual reality. The world says, live and learn. God is saying, learn and live. So learn this wisdom. And then you will live a good life. That's what it's saying. So we're learning from other people's experience, from their life experience. Remember, this is, this is the life experience of the ancient wise people. This is the stuff that has worked over time. Now, our culture doesn't really value ancient things, old things. If it's old, then it's useless because it's outdated and it's not. What do you need that for? You need the newest phone. Because it has five cameras instead of four. And, like, you got to have it. I mean, it has an even more, an even higher density of pixels in the screen that your eye can't actually perceive, but it's better. You need it because it's new. I mean, if you look up information about how to use Facebook for something and the article is more than, like, three months old, you might as well ignore it. Because it's useless. Everything has changed already. If you're not keeping up with the times, what are you doing? So whatever, whatever is, has more progress, whatever is new, cutting edge, that's what's best. That's how you should live your life. You should live your life with the cutting edge stuff. And the book of Proverbs disagrees. You live your life according to wisdom, ancient, tried and true wisdom. That's what you should live your life by. Quote Anders in his Holman Old Testament commentary, the Proverbs are intended to present brief, catchy statements of truth designed to hit home with maximum impact. And what you should glean from this, and we'll talk much, much more about this in coming weeks, these are generally true and therefore do not account for exceptions. Log that away. When you're interpreting Proverbs, you should just interpret them as this is generally true, not always. So, for example, Proverbs 18.22, Whoso findeth a wife, findeth a good thing, and obtaineth favor of the Lord. Is that always true? Do you, I mean, <laughs> husbands? <laughs> Everybody said, <laughs> uh, yeah, it's a good thing. Uh, I tell you. Mm. That's right. In the overall meta narrative, 
the way God created things, wife is a good thing. If you find a wife, you find a good thing. You've obtained favor from the Lord. But there's also, that's assuming, kind of, it's a good thing if both are on the same page, husband and wife, and both are working in the same direction, and neither of them are too selfish. If you find a selfish wife, I don't know if you found favor with the Lord. <laughs> I mean, and there are other Proverbs that talk about that. But generally speaking, whoso findeth a wife findeth a good thing. You're blessed. Is that always true? Right? Like a drip, <laughs> right? Constant. Yeah. I mean, right. So there are other Proverbs that talk to that part of, of, the li of life. So all I'm saying here is these are general truths. You can't take them as promises or law. Don't interpret them that way. You will ruin your life. You will. You will ruin your life if you interpret wisdom that way. We'll talk much, much more about that probably next week, <clears throat> depending on how far we get along here. Does anybody have any favorite Proverbs? Whether from the book of Proverbs or just like general truths that like in American culture. Any pithy sayings that come to mind? Yeah, she tears it down like brick by brick. Can you just like whatever? Yeah, no, that's that's a good one. Wise woman builds her house. She builds up. She doesn't tear down. Foolish woman just destroys everything. It's full, right? You have a path. Which way are you going to go? You want to be a wise woman or a foolish woman? You need to decide every day with your choices and your actions. Any other proverbs that Uh, three, five. Trust in the Lord with all, yeah. Lean not under your own understandings, right? It's, it's good stuff. That's just like, that's just one to like have logged away in your brain. It's like, ooh, I should pray. <laughs> you know, like, man, trust in the Lord. Trust, trust in the Lord, trust in the Lord. I've got a few that I picked in case nobody said. But Proverbs thirteen twelve, Hope deferred maketh the heart sick. I mean, just, you just, I mean, that's only the first half, but just think about that. When you're hoping in something and it's deferred even, like, oh man, it'd be really great to get that raise. Deferred. 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 Or it's like, ah, oh, we, we need to have this uh, medical treatment, but the doctor's not available until this date, and then it's deferred. And it gets deferred. It makes your heart sick. Right? But when the desire cometh, it is a tree of life. Like when your desire is fulfilled, it's so good. So good. Proverbs 14, 4. When no oxen, yeah, where no oxen are, the crib is clean. But much increase is by the strength of the ox. That's not telling you to do anything. It's just something you're supposed to chew over. So if you're a farmer and you're planting your crops and you're threshing your grain and stuff, you could do that all by yourself. You could get your, you could, you know, cut your grain. You could hit it with a stick and break the chaff off the grain and then throw it up into the air. Or you could have an ox. And an ox pulls this heavy sled over your grain, it breaks it open, and then you got to scoop it up and throw it into the air and thresh it and do all that. But an ox can pull a heavy sled. And it's less work for you. But then your stable's full of poop. And you got to clean out the poop. So what do you want to do? It's up to you, right? It's not saying, oh, you should definitely have an ox. Every person should get an ox. Maybe you don't need an ox. If you have an ox, you can get a lot done. It's also a lot of poop. You got to clean it up. Somebody's got to do it. It's just, you know, it's something to think about. And you can apply that to what you do at work. 
Maybe you're deciding to buy something for your family to help in some way, some device, right? It's like, oh man, we got this new dishwasher and then five years later it breaks down somehow. Now you got to call like, yeah, it does a lot. It does a lot of work. It's great. But now it's, it's so fancy. It has this microchip that you have to wait 10 years to get. And now you're out of a, you know, maybe you should just wash your dishes. There's only two of you in the house. You know, it's like, <laughs> yeah. Proverbs 14, 10, the heart knoweth its own bitterness and a stranger doth not intermeddle with his joy. So your joy and your suffering are yours. And so when you're, when you're talking with somebody and they're going through suffering, like you can try and sympathize, but you can't really truly understand. It's theirs. It's, it's going to be a little bit different. But same with joy. It's yours. Proverbs 15.1, a soft answer turneth away wrath, but a grievous word stirs up anger. How you say what you say really matters. If you're overly harsh, you're going to stir up more anger in the person you're talking to. General truth. Unless they're exceedingly patient. Don't count on it. But, possible. So, the, this wisdom, it's not all from Solomon in the book of Proverbs, but they're in the same vein as Solomon's wisdom. Um, Hezekiah's men, we got Lemuel, Augur, the sayings of the wise. It's unknown who the sayings of the wise came from, but that's later in the book of Proverbs as you read through it. Um, and again, it's broken up into, into big sections. You got chapters one through nine, which are not the typical Proverbs that you think of. And then after that, you have the Proverbs of Solomon. And then there's another section of the Proverbs of Solomon, and there's the sayings of the wise. And then you have Proverbs of uh, Augur and Lemuel. And then you have, it finishes up with the wise woman. Proverbs 31, woman. You have like Lady Wisdom right at the very end of the first nine chapters. So that's like the first bookend. And then it ends with what a wise woman looks like. And it kind of bookends the rest of all of these seemingly random proverbs throughout the rest of the book. Which is a nice little, little book in there. But who is Solomon? Solomon is the son of David, king of Israel. He was the son of David and Bathsheba. And he became king after David, built the temple, expanded the borders of Israel further than any other king. And then after him, the kingdom split, and it was pretty terrible. What he does is the Lord comes to him and asks him, ask whatever you want, and I'll give it to you. He goes, well, I'll read it to you. First Kings, chapter 3, 5 through 13. So in Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a, in a dream by night. And God said, ask what I shall give thee. This is a blank check. Whatever you want, ask it. I'll give it to you. Man. And Solomon said, Thou hast showed unto thy servant David, my father, great mercy, according as he walked before thee in truth and in righteousness and in uprightness of heart with thee. Just think of David's life. pretty generous description of his father considering his mom is that whole thing and thou hast kept for him this great kindness that thou hast given him a son to sit on his throne as it is this day and now O lord my god thou hast made thy servant king instead of david my father and i am but a little child solomon's a grown man at this point king but he says i am a little child walk that away and i do not know how to go in or, or to go out or come in he doesn't know how to lead the people of israel as king go out and come in that's a so you, not a euphemism but a, it's a figure of speech basically just saying hey i don't know how to lead 
and thy servant is in the midst of thy people, which thou hast chosen, a great people, that, thou ca- that cannot be numbered nor counted for multitude. Verse 9, this is what he asks. Give therefore thy servant an understanding heart to judge thy people, that I may discern between good and bad. For who is able to judge this, thy so great a people? So he wants wisdom. He wants understanding. He wants to be able to make judgments because he's the king. He'll he'll have to make those judgments. That's how he's going to lead his people in wisdom. And all of it kind of boils down to discerning good and evil. Discerning good and evil. He's asking for that. He's saying, I don't know how to discern between good and evil. I need you to help me with that. So he's asking for wisdom. And the speech pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this thing. And God said unto him, Because thou hast asked this thing, and hast not asked for thyself long life, neither hast thou asked riches for thyself, nor hast thou uh, asked the life of thine enemies, but hast asked for thyself understanding to, to discern judgment. Behold, I have done according to thy words. Lo, I have given thee a wise and understanding heart, so that... There was none like thee before thee, neither after thee shall there be any arise like unto thee. And I have also given thee that which thou hast not asked, both riches and honor, so that there shall be, or that there shall not be any among the kings like unto thee all thy days. So God appears to Solomon, asks him what he wants, and he asks for wisdom. He doesn't know how to lead. He wants moral discernment and leadership. That's what he wants. But it's to discern good and evil. If This should draw your mind back to the Garden of Eden. And I want to compare the differences between what Solomon asked for and what happened in the Garden of Eden. Because this is how wisdom literature works. You, you read, you compare these different stories. Right? Because when you read the first three chapters of Genesis, it seems like God doesn't want humanity to have the discernment of good and evil. That's the only tree they're not allowed to eat from, the knowledge of good and evil. Is that something God doesn't want humanity to have? He told them not to eat from the tree. That seems a little weird. Because when we read about Solomon, that's exactly what he's asking for. And God gives it graciously and abundantly. More so in him than any other person any other king that comes after him. So what's going on here? We should look at the two stories and compare them. This is how wisdom literature works. This is how you do, uh, you know, the interpreting scripture with scripture. You're comparing the two things and seeing what the differences are, what the similarities are. So this harkens back to Genesis 3, 4 through 8. And the serpent said unto the woman, You shall not surely die. So he asked her, Hey, can you eat of all the trees? She's like, yeah, we can eat all of them except for that one in the midst, in the middle of the garden. And he goes, what's up with that one? That one so bad? Like, well, if we eat of that one or we touch it, definitely get, we'll surely die. He goes, you will not surely die. For God doth know that in the day you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened. That seems like a good thing. And you shall be as gods. You'll be like the divine beings. Knowing good and evil. That's something in the divine realm. Knowing good and evil. Yep. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, that pleasant to the eyes, that's the same word for covetousness. Oh my goodness. Is that right? As so she's, she's wanting it. She has a strong desire for it. And that the tree, and a tree to be desired to make one wise. That's what we're talking about here. Wisdom. It's the knowledge of good and evil. Wisdom. Those two ideas come together here. She took of the fruit thereof and did eat. And gave also unto her husband and he did eat. And the eyes of them were both opened. And they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made for themselves aprons. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord amongst the trees of the garden. I always love that. Like, 
They did something wrong. They realized they did something wrong. They try to hide, but they try to hide among all the things that they were told that they were allowed to do. Not anywhere near the thing that they were not supposed to do. So I did this wrong thing, so I need to do a bunch of good things to, to block the, you know, to outdo the bad thing. You ever find yourself doing that? So there's some, there's some notes from the Net Bible that are really good. Um, and so I'll just, I'll just quote these directly and for your consideration. The quest for wisdom can follow the wrong course, as indeed it does here. No one can become like God by disobeying God. It is that simple. The book of Proverbs stresses that obtaining wisdom begins with the fear of God. That is evidenced through obedience to his word. Here, in seeking wisdom, Eve disobeys God and ends up afraid of God. Do you see the reversal? The beginning of knowledge and the beginning of wisdom is the fear of the Lord. That's our verse alert, Proverbs 1.7. So you're supposed to start with the fear of the Lord. And then you can begin the path of wisdom and knowledge. Eve flipped it. She went to pursue wisdom on her own, did what was right in her own eyes, and then she ended up afraid of God, who had only been good to her. Do you see that reversal? So cool. Another note <clears throat> uh, from, yeah. Another view understands knowledge of good and evil as the capacity to discern between moral good and evil. The following context suggests that the tree's fruit gives one wisdom, which certainly includes the capacity to discern between good and evil. That's what Solomon asked for. That's me breaking in. That's not part of the quote. But that's what Solomon asked for, the ability to discern between good and evil. Back to the quote. Such wisdom is characteristic of divine beings, as the serpent, serpent's promise implied in 3.5, you shall be as gods, right? And as 3.22 makes clear. So in 3.22, God says, oh, we need to put an angel at the, at the gate of the Garden of Eden to make sure that the, hum the humans don't go in and eat from the tree of life and live forever. Sinful state. Right? So he says, let us put an angel in front of there with a flaming sword. <clears throat> Note, however, that this capacity does not include the ability to do what is right. The knowledge of it, but not the ability. Again, you can have all the facts in the world and have no idea what to do with it. Need wisdom. Again, that was me breaking in. God prohibits man from eating of the tree. The prohibition becomes a test to see if man will be satisfied with his role and place, or if he will try to ascend to the divine level. There will be a time for, a, for man to possess moral discernment and wisdom, as God reveals and imparts it to him. Right? But it is not something to be grasped, to be grasped at in an effort to become a god. It's not the way you're supposed to do it. God was going to reveal that to humanity in due time. But it wasn't quick enough. Back to the quote. In fact, the command to be obedient was the first lesson in moral discernment and wisdom. God was essentially saying, here is lesson one. Respect my authority and commands. Fear the Lord. Beginning of wisdom. Disobey me and you will die. When man disobeys, he decides he does not want to acquire moral wisdom God's way, but instead tries to rise immediately to the divine level. Once man has acquired such divine wisdom by eating the tree's fruit, he must be banned from the garden so that he will not be able to achieve his goal of being godlike and thus live forever. The divine characteristic, 324. Ironically, man now has the capacity to discern good from evil, but he is morally corrupt and rebellious and will not constantly choose what is right. Fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. We have to do it God's way. He reveals it to us. We need to be like Solomon and ask for wisdom, right? That's what he wanted. And the reason it was bad, the difference between the two stories, is because Eve took it for herself. And Adam too, he was there. He didn't stop her. They took it. Whereas Solomon asks for it. 
Does God want to give us wisdom? Absolutely. This will be the last quote. Or not. Where is it? it? Should be James right here. I thought I put the text from James. Well, maybe not. But that was the second bell, so let's pray. Our Father in heaven, thank you so much for your wisdom. Thank you for this book. I pray it's an encouragement to your people, and I pray that, um, Lord, I pray for wisdom. I pray that you would help us to discern good from evil and make wise decisions. Lord, help us to, to live in this world. Uh, even though it's full of sinful people, Lord, help us to be a shining light of, of a wise and discerning people. Lord, help us to worship you as, as we will in just a few minutes. Lord, help us to sing praises to your name and uh, understand the preaching of your word. Or may we be challenged and may we leave with, uh, with an application from your word that will draw us closer to you and a closer walk with you. In Jesus' name.